This is a recording of the process of me making an inventory plugin for the CTJS game engine. The purpose of this video is to showcase various features of the engine while going through a realistic scenario of creating a project, troubleshooting included. I hope you learned something from watching and consider giving this engine a try. Inventory test. Uh, JavaScript, of course. I don't need a tutorial. All right. Uh, let's start with getting some assets. Yeah, I guess I'll take these. Yeah, let me just import everything. Oh. Oh, that's a lot. Uh, how can I? Yeah, let me make a group. All right, can I like, oh God, is there a way for me to, <laughs> uh oh, <laughs> great start already. Uh, yeah, all right, this will take a moment. There we go, okay. Let me see if I remember how to make rooms and stuff. Uh, Boy by 720, that's fine. Okay, I'm gonna need a character. I make a character, the boy. You'll do. All right, now I need actions and input methods generic x and y movement perfect oh wow i forget how much this does for you but like the default stuff yeah that works now i can add an event and then do look for the action events so on move x i want a move x event i want a Move Y event. That should be it. Okay, values. The number that should come out from the event. I believe that's how parameterized events work. Probably. There we go. Alright, let's see. Let's just see what happens. I'm just going to see what happens. I am a genius, smartest developer ever. All right, um, let's give it a proper speed variable. Five. Just make that a multiplier to the value here. Should move faster now. Whoa, buddy, where are you going? Hey. What happened? What are you? What? What is happening? Hello? Oh, speed is a built-in. Speed, speed's a built-in variable. I can't, I can't call it speed. It's, <laughs> okay. Yep. Um, what am I calling you? Best. Right. All right, this should work. There we go. Just like that, I have four directional movement. Great. So, all right, inventory. So, f first of all, I need a new I need a UI layer. So, CTJS you want to make UI tags along with your viewport, you make it a separate room and then you layer it over the game and it, you can make a, you can tag it so that's a UI layer. That just makes a lot of things easier. So I need to do that. So it's a new room now. I'm going to call you 
UI. It's got some UI elements, huh? Let me just put this as a, just give it a sprite for starters. UI control, okay. So the idea is, let's pretend this is my UI. It's gonna stay on the top. It should stay in the top left corner if I do this right. I might actually need to look up how to do that. Yes, so this needs to be checked. Viewport, all that should be fine. Okay, I believe in the room start code for my game, which I'm gonna call main. I need, I need the events. Yeah, there we go. I gotta look this up. Okay. So I'm gonna append. Is it, did I just call it UI? What I call it? Yeah. Okay. I think this will work. I'm appending the room to this room. Okay. Yeah. Let's run it. Okay, it's rendering over the object. That's good, but I need to prove that the UI is going to come with the camera. I need to make sure it's scrolling with the viewport. So I need a bigger main room. Test that. 2400 by 1800. Now I need the camera to follow the player. Okay, I think I want... Whoops, creation event exists. I want to do, call this just once. Follow. I think this is a method, so I call it like that. And I just realized I'm not going to be able to tell if anything's scrolling because the background's all one thing. I need some. I need some things to put in here. The number four. Yeah, that stuff. I don't think, I, no, okay, no. There, that's a little more organized. All right. Camera.fall is not a function. No. I messed up. It must be a property then. So let me try setting equal to this. This being the boy. Oh, look at that. Oh, oh my god, I'm so smart. Look at that. See, UI staying, the layer staying where it is, that circle staying with the viewport. All right, inventory system. Um, What do I want this to do? Let me, I should define my requirements here. Actually, I can define it. I got this project notepad. That's what this is for. I want it to make it flexible and I want to make it like a library so other people can use this for their own projects. But let's just start simple. So I need, I need to be able to select an item. Select an item, perform action with item. I need to add them to inventory, remove item from inventory, I need listeners when player is interacting with inventory, so like events basically, um, and move item from one spot to another. I th think that would be a good baseline for an inventory system. Oh, and then like actually display, I need to display inventory somehow on the screen, probably in the UI layer. I want like a grid of cells here to, to visualize the inventory. What am I going to put in the cells? I don't know. I got to think about what data needs to go in here first. All right, I'm back. Uh, I did quite a few things. Uh, since the last cut, it's just that I needed to figure out how I was going to organize this inventory system, how I was going to make it, and what kind of features I needed. So here's the boy. Nothing's changed there. 
um, the UI has this inventory object in the UI layer. So that's where the UI is going to get drawn. Okay, so we go over to, first of all, to here. Everything's pretty much the same here. Item hat didn't gain anything. Um, inventory. So that's that object in the UI layer. So it's, it's going to do some things now. Um, I made this other object I'll get into after. I'll, I'll briefly explain everything. But basically, I'm making this inventory library. So you can imagine this inventory is just like some library object uh, that I'm referencing. So first of all, I'm initializing inventory. I'm passing it how many slots I want. And then for every one of those slots, I need to return a copy um, that's representative of the inventory item. So I have, that's what this inventory item is for. It's, it's an empty inventory uh, slot. So I'm just making that into the UI layer, positioning it uh, according to how I want it to be positioned and then returning it. And the library will take care of instantiating. And then I'm making a hat sprite and then I'm adding it to the zero if index of the inventory. And then I'm listening for events that could happen in the inventory, such as a user selecting an item or a user trying to perform an action with an item. And those are, those are just methods, stubs. Uh, I haven't done anything with them yet. And then for inventory item, um, I'm actually calling another set of functions that was part of this inventory object that telling it whether I'm selecting. So if I select this box, that means I'm clicking this box and this click event happens. I'm passing it the index of this inventory item. And then this is just pre me pressing spacebar. Um, it, it's not, that could be a jump in the game, but it should, this is what happens when I press spacebar. I want to perform the action of it. So then I call this action method in this inventory and I pass the index so I know which inventory item it was that was selected. Um, unlike the click where it's specific to one, um, it's specific to the, the box that you clicked on, on jump press is going to run for all the boxes, all these inventory items. So what I have to do is make sure that the index that was selected is in fact the, the box that I wanted to perform the action with. So that's, a, that's why there's a difference here. Um, so what does the, where's this inventory library? Well, custom scripts, uh, I added this custom script here and basically everything you write in here under like, for like var variables are global. So these are global variables. Uh, these two won't be global later. I just needed them here uh, for now, but here's the, here's that object that I define all these methods. So it's got selected index. Uh, so when this select button is pressed back when I, the inventory box was passing in the index, this is what gets called here. So it makes it so that I have this selected index available to read now. And then I'm, I got these listeners, um, potentially that I need to send out select events to. So that's what's happening here. I'm going through all the listeners. Um, and passing in the select event and then passing in the cell that was selected and then same with action, but with the, this action string. So if I go back to the inventory object, um, that's, that's when this gets called, here's the action. And then here's the cell that it gets called. So I'll get that in this part. Okay. So if I go back to here, here's the initialization. Or I'm passing an inventory size and then there's a callback function. So I'm calling this callback, passing the index and assuming I get a copy out. So that was me doing this stuff here. So this is, this function gets called when that happens and then I'm returning the copy and then I get that back here. And then I'm just basically keeping track of all the cells in this array here. So that's the reason for that. And then, when I add an item to the list, I'm going to uh, get the index that I wanted to add the item to, and I'm going to add the sprite to the child of cell so it gets rendered. 
And then here's the adding a listener. So I'm just adding it to the list of listeners here, passing in a, uh, a callback function to receive events for. And that's it. It's a little complicated, but if I go ahead and launch it, uh, there's the inventory. So I initialized 10 slots and then I positioned them however I want. And then I said I was going to add the hat item to index zero. And that's what I have so far. So I'm able to add items to this inventory. And now I just need a way to actually like perform a selection on them properly and then do an action with them. All right, so I'm going to try and fill this out. And again, the only reason, the reason why I'm doing this is this is going to be the library. Like this, all, all this script that I've written here for the custom script, that's going to be handled by the library. So this is not, none of this is something the developer will have to write. The developer will only need to write like this stuff. And uh, this needed to be in a set timeout because the room list data isn't available immediately on the creation event. So I had to wait basically a frame. Uh, you can just consider it that way. It wait, it just waits a tiny amount and then gets to the UI layer data. So that's why it's wrapped in a set timeout. So yeah, I'm, now I'm going to implement these two cases here where I do get a selection from the player and an action event from the player. All right, so I need to draw UI select texture. I don't have a texture for that, I think. There you are, UI select. Yeah, so I need I need to draw this over whatever item is being selected. So let's do that. All right, so like the most stupid, easiest thing I could possibly do is just take the cell that I got passed in that was selected and just make another sprite and then attach it. There is going to be a very obvious problem with that though, which I will demonstrate. All right, so to recap, I get an event that some user has clicked on an inventory item this calls the select function of my inventory library. The inventory library receives that uh, function invocation and then <laughs> passes that event along to all the listeners. The listener from this inventory object, not the library, receives that action event and then draws the item select and adds it to the cell that I passed it in. So let's see if this works first of all. It looks like I'm not moving, but I am. It doesn't even matter. So, so if I click that, okay. Oh yeah, it's like the same size. So first of all, you can't even see the UI select, but it, it drew it, right? Like I clicked it and it selected it. The problem is the previous selections aren't going to go away when I click on another cell. So I have to clear out somehow the other cells. Um, so first of all, I should be able to see, I think that's the way I can tell how many children a cell has. Yeah. So they shouldn't have any children, which means I should be able to just kill all the children. <laughs> I should be able to just uh, uh, destroy all the children um, if I do a selection anywhere else. That sounds bad, but uh, that's that's the nomenclature. That's what the that's that it's what it's called. All right, I I don't know what to tell you. I need to wipe out the children of all the other cells. Um, unfortunately, I don't have access. Well, I can't assume I will have access to that information. I want to make this private at least, but I probably should just, I think I'm actually just going to add that all this information into the object so I can access this stuff, We're calling inventory dot whatever. All the re other references to cells now needs to say inventory dot cells. There we go. <laughs> 
your inventory listeners, inventory listeners, inventory listeners. Uh, okay, looks like all the problems are solved. So now what I can do is do a for each on all the cells here and then ah uh, how do i destroy all the children okay i think i figured it out remove child you need to actually pass in the object you want to remove it's not an index thing that's not what i even want this method is what i want remove children that's what it's called according to the api anyways it's better view this better be it. Oh. Oh, my hat's gone. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it works. But now my hat's gone. <laughs> oh, no. That's right, because the hat... I did the same process, right? Just added this, the hat of the sprite to... The, okay. Okay. I gotta be a little smarter about how I draw these and how I remove the drawings. Wait, 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 Okay, remove child. Oh, but no, I need the reference of the previous item select. Hold on, hold on, hold on. This this might, might be onto something here. Um, okay, no, wait, okay. Previous item select. This is what I'm gonna do. This is what I'm going to do. The previous item selection, I'm going to keep a reference to it. Every time select it's called, I'm going to call remove child and then pass this in. Right? So right now it's null. So nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to get removed. I'm going to make a new item select then and attach it to the child I was I clicked on uh, for the cell. And then... I'm going to set previous item select to this object I made. So now this will be populated. So now the next time a select event happens, it's going to go through all the cells and remove the, the previous item select specifically. So now it's not going to just overwrite anything else that the cells might have as children. It's going to go find specifically this reference and then remove it. And then I do this whole process again. I get another item select. It adds it to the cell, and then I store that as a reference. And because this is basically a single object, a singleton, if you will, um, I think this will be fine. Oh, it works. Look at that. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. Okay, first of all, though, it needs to be, maybe I, I think I can just tint it. I think I can tint sprites. I think I literally just do something like this. Default value is, okay, so I do hexadecimal format. So let's make it red. I think this is how you do it in JavaScript. You just write the hex like that. So... The item select is now going to be tinted red, so it should look red. Oh, yes! Oh my god, yes. That looks so good. Now I know what thing I selected. And now is the action. Now I want something to happen when I do perform an action, which in my case is going to be the space bar. So I think what I want, I'm going to select it. And then when I press the space bar, oh yeah, the lock, you can see the lock works first of all with uh, whatever box I selected. That's box eight, that's box nine, box zero is the first one. I'm gonna make him wear the hat. Yeah, put the hat on the boy. We're gonna put the hat on the boy. Yeah, I wanna make sure that my library is flexible enough to handle sprites and objects like this. So even though it's not efficient to do this, um, I'm going to make this an actual copy. I'm going to copy it into the same room as the character. So you are called item hat. 
item hat. You're going to spawn. Okay, I need a reference to the boy now. Yeah, this thing. This thing right here. All right. I need to find a copy. So find, yes, find the first copy of a specific template. So I do CT templates list, followed by the reference, uh, the name of the object, and then zero to get the first one. Okay, got it. Um, first, I should see if the boy exists, so I don't cause an error. So if, the, if there's no boys. Then I don't even want to continue on. But if there is a boy, we're putting this hat on him. So the hat's going to go... So it's, I'm going to draw it on zero, 0, just to see what happens. But now I have the boy, I can... I think... Can I add a game object as a child like this? I think I can? Actually, I don't know if I've ever tried this. This is a copy, which is not like a sprite. But I'm adding it as a child. So I'm wondering if the coordinates will still update. Let's find out. All right, so hat select. Oh, space. Oh, I think it worked. Let me get some, let me get some like fours scattered around here. So I have like, so I know that I'm moving. Okay, select space. Yeah. Oh, that works. You can just add child to it and it'll just get attached. It'll really just get attached to it. Um, I mean, it's not positioned well. So, uh, I gotta fix that. That's these X and Y coordinates. X coordinates fine. The Y coordinate needs to be probably the half of boy's height. The boy height divided by two. That'll like offset it upward no negative height divided by two will uh, offset it upward let's try that oh my god i'm the smartest developer in the universe <laughs> wait so what happens if i select nothing and then do the action oh wait Oh, right, I'm just spawning the hat regardless. I'm not taking this, the cells item into account. Okay. Uh, that can be fixed. That's what this... Okay, that's what this is for. So when I pass an add, that's, that's why I did this. I forgot. So when I pass an add, I'm passing an index, the sprite, and an, a name. That's what happens here. So the sprite gets added to the child here, so it renders on the screen. This template name, right. So this template name doesn't do anything right now. What I could do um, is attach it to the cell object here, so then I can retrieve it later. I don't know if this is the best way I should do this. I'm basically just forcing a property I'm injecting a property into the cell like this. So if I add the template name to the cell, I want to remove it if the item is moved out of that cell for any reason. That's just something I gotta I gotta remember. So I should be able to do so I get the cell here, so I should be able to do cell template name. And I can check if there's anything in here. And if there isn't, I'm just not gonna do anything. If there is, then I will spawn it in like this. Where now I'm using the template name to find a copy of it and instantiate it. All right, and then the template name is item hat. So let's see if this works. First of all, I'm gonna press space. Okay, nothing happens. I'm selecting an empty inventory. I'm pressing space, nothing happens. Now I'm going to select the hat and press space. Okay. That worked. Um, I'm pretty certain, however, that this guy is having multiple hats spawn on top of him every time I press space. So, 
that's what this previous item is going to come into play. So I'm going to do the same thing I did before here. I think I can just do, I think I just call directly. Yeah, I can just, I don't need a poor loop. I just need to call the boy and then remove the child directly because I directly added him here. And now I do remove the previous item action. Then I add the hat, add it to the boy, and now previous item action becomes the hat that I can then remove later. There, I got I got more hats now. So I'm just gonna add a bunch of hats. Hat one, hat two, hat three, hat four. I I did that wrong. There. Hat one, hat two, hat three, hat four. I'm gonna add it at zero, two, three, and and six. Just to test that these indices are working. Okay. So let's see if those hats got added properly. Oh you are going places what the heck happened so what are you doing here get in the index of the inventory cell you're setting the sprite x and y so that of the cells x and y values um is that not correct it should be drawing here that is correct oh it's doubling everything. Wait. I get it. Okay. <laughs> so I'm adding these textures, right? They have their own X, Y values, whatever. Inventory add, what it's doing is adding it to the child. So now its coordinate system is that of the cells. So I don't need to do this at all. Because it's already, when you add the, a child from one object into the cell, it's going to adopt it, the cell's coordinates. And by me doing this, offsetting it, and then adding a child, it's like performing that twice. So I bet if I get rid of that, now it's going to work. Yeah. Okay. I, I wasn't supposed to set the coordinates it, it would have just done that automatically so that's zero one two three four five six seven eight nine that's correct and now can i equip you <laughs> yes i can top hat oh look at that it swaps out what i should do i should work on being able to maybe have a hat pickup on the ground so I'm actually gonna need whole new game objects for this. So let me do so this doesn't get confusing. Let me make a pickup group. And then create something in, in here. So let me do let me get a I'm gonna make the okay, I'm just gonna do this. Top hat pickup. So I'm going to Mm, I'm gonna give my boy everything to the top hat. He's got to pick up the top hat himself. So pick up, top hat pick up. So when a collision happens, there's collisions, right? I forget. Yeah, collision with the template. So when you collide with the boy, you should get added as an item to the inventory. Right, how do I know what position to add this in. I need to figure out the index dynamically because the inventory is going to be partially full already. So I need a way to tell whether an inventory item already has a slot taken. Um, right now, the only way, the only good way at least is either checking if the cell already has a child or checking its template. If it's zero, that means it doesn't have anything. That means I can add the item in there. So the index is going to be i, the index, and then I'm passing in that sprite, which I should not create unless I need to. 
So it's going to go in here. And then I'm going to break out of the loop because I don't want to fill up the rest of the inventory. I don't want to fill up all the inventory slots that are empty with the hat. So I think this will work. And then this pickup will destroy itself. And I just realized I did not add the hat to the room. Where are you? Pickup. Top hat pickup. You can go there. That looks like a good place. So if I run over this. Oh, that, oh God. What happened? Can I read properties of null? Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, first of all, do not do that. Um, <laughs> this is the proper way to delete an object. Don't do what I did, unless you're dumb. Uh, so kill equals true. That's the proper way to dispose of a, uh, a copy. There we go. So yeah, it went through all of the indices and didn't actually add the item. So let me see what's up with that. This one has one child because it has the hat in it. All right, children, length. Wait, did I put length? I'll check that after. But the second object here has no children, so it should have stopped here. Oh, I didn't do length. Uh, I didn't do length. I'm dumb. There, the length, the number of children equal to zero. That should work. You added the wrong element. How did you do that? That's how. <laughs> okay, yeah. It should uh not be that. It should be this. And I don't need these logs anymore because I know this is gonna work now. There we go. But now will this work? Can I now select this and then wear it? Yes, I can. Mm. I think it'd be cool if I select an empty one. It just it'll just remove the hat. I should I should implement that. So that's gonna be in the inventory object here. Yeah, so I should always remove previous hats that may exist. So this code should go here. I still need to check if the boy exists and then bail out early if it if he doesn't. But this is when I do it. And then I can check if template name exists. I think that's the strategy. So I'm gonna add it, I'm gonna get a hat, and I'm gonna select one empty cell and then action. Yeah, that looks like that works. Pickup items works well with this with this structure. Now I need to figure out how I want to remove an item and uh, swap items around, or at least just, yeah, just move them around in the inventory. All right, so I'm going to make a command where you press backspace on a selected item and it will just remove the item. I could make it drop to the ground and then like you can pick it back up again, but I think that's an unnecessary. I just want to make sure it's possible for a developer to use the library to just remove an item in the inventory. So that's what I'm gonna do. So first of all, I need an action update because I need an input key binding to an action for deleting an item. So I'm going to add an action. It's going to call delete item. Input method is going to be just backspace. I'm just going to do that. And then here's the action that I want to check against. So now, for inventory item, if the action delete item has been pressed, um, again, this is a backspace keyboard event. It's going to trigger for all of these boxes. So I want to make sure only the selected one is going to 
I have something done to it. So I'm just going to do the same if condition. I want to call any new API, then I don't have, I don't have like an event for like signifying that a user wanted to remove an item. It doesn't have to necessarily be delete, but just like the, some API to call a remove like this. And okay, so whatever I added here, I need to remove later. So I need to be really careful about how I do this. <laughs> okay. Um, here's what I gotta do. I gotta keep this reference so I know I can remove it later at some point. So I'm gonna need another name like this. And you know what? I'm going to make this a little more explicit. This is specifically an inventory variable. I want those to be explicit. Like, yes, you're using the inventory library. This is a variable injected, uh, property injected uh, values. So I think having just consistent prefix of inventory is going to make things a little less uh, ridiculous. And now this should be available. I should be able to call inventory.remove. And now you're going to have the sprite and the template name injected in the add. So then when you remove it, I should be able to get rid of those. Well, first of all, reference those if needed and then remove those um, variables so that it's not part of the cell anymore. So what I'm going to do first is I need to clear out the sprite that got added as a child here. So it's just going to be, should I, remove, ooh, should I do this first or should I call the listeners first? Uh, but anyway, it's going to look like this. So I'm going to remove the child of the sprite that it had. So it's not rendering in there anymore. This, this it wouldn't be attached to the cell. It's just a string reference. So I really just need to null those properties. That's all I got to do for that. So I'm just going to... I'm just going to null them out. So by default, it's just going to... That I think that's it. By default, this is just going to work. So if I like press back, backspace on you... Oh, look at that! And there's no errors on deleting um, cells with nothing in them already. There we go. Yeah, deletion works. That's cool. That was surprisingly simple. I mean, I did say I wasn't going to make it drop on the ground. But yeah, so an intention to remove should do that. That makes sense to me. So now is the last thing. Now I want to either swap or just move, or I guess it's technically a swap regardless. So some way to like either drag and drop an item from here to another place or something. I'm not sure how I want to implement that yet. So I got to think about that for a moment. Okay. I think I know what I want to do. This is going to by far be the most difficult to implement, but I think realistically it's what most players would expect from an inventory system that allows you to move items around i'm gonna to have to do some drag and drop kind of system so uh any of these could have a left click held down action which can start some process i while holding the left click down i then move my cursor to another one of these cells and then i let go on the cell i want that item to move to and then it will move to that spot. And if there is an item already there, it will just swap the two uh, the two items in those two spaces. Is there a click down? Pointer down. That's what I want. I want pointer down. I'm gonna need two new events now. Okay, move, move from. I decided it's gonna be move from and move to. So on a pointer up, 
I'm gonna do a move two on this index, and then I'm gonna have move froms and move twos defined in this inventory library. Again, the, the, the listeners are gonna get those uh, events with the same names called. I don't know if the library is gonna do anything special here yet. Probably, it probably should. It probably should remember. Uh, man. I should do a move cancel. There should be a move cancel operation where I don't even need an index. So move cancel can just be freely called at any time and it will stop this process. But uh, when the process starts, I think I need to keep track of an index that the index here so that it could be referenced to later. So move from, I'm going to define it before listeners are called. Move index is going to be here. So here's, here's where it's going to start doing some work. So I don't want to pass out move to events if a move from hasn't happened already. So I'm going to check if root index is not null. Or in this case, I would check if it is null and if it is, don't continue. There should always be a from before a to. So there should always be some registered intent to move an item before uh, actually performing the move. That's what this is doing. And then after the intention happens, after these listeners are called, I'm going to set it to null. So that the move index, so that this process should be complete. And then move cancel is just going to do this. So I'm going to have two new actions now. I'm going to have a move from action that I got to actually do something with and a move to action that I got to do something with. Okay, so when I'm moving from, the move index is uh, taken care of. Like that's already defined for me by now because the way I wrote this move from that move index is defined by the time the listeners are called. So I have that information of what cell is being selected at this point. I'm going to extract the sprite from the cell child. I'm going to extract the child and make him, a, <laughs> make him translucent. That's what I'm going to do. So it needs to have at least one child. And if it doesn't have a child, um, oh, don't forget length, the length of the children, children's an array, then I'm going to return out and then do the move cancel. I'm canceling the move. So now at this point, I'm assuming there is a child. So I'm going to get the sprite from it. Get child at the zeroth index. So now I, ha I should have the sprite that was rendered at that point. And then I'm going to need a new object for this. But this is going to be cool. This is going to be cool. So drag, and I'm going to call it drag and drop. It's not going to have anything, but it is going to follow the cursor at every frame. So pointer X, pointer Y, and then um, I'm going to set the alpha of this thing to 0.5. I just want this to always be whatever texture it adopts, it's going to be translucent. 
and it's always going to follow the player. That makes sense to me. And then for simplicity's sake right now, I think I'm just going to add the drag and drop. Oh, wait. This should be in the UI layer. Because like, this is specifically with UI stuff. Yeah. I'm going to put the drag and drop. I'm just going to have a global drag and drop thing. And it's just going to be invisible most of the time. I could make it appear and disappear as I'm moving items around. But it seems like the quicker method right now. So drag and drop in inventory. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so I'm going to get the sprite, I'm going to go find the drag and drop item, um, which is CT templates list drag and drop. So you need to be populated, and if you're not, then uh, I'm a bad programmer, I guess. But here, here's the drag and drop copy. Uh, once, assuming I get it, and then I want to set its texture to the sprite that I just found. So let's see if this even works, because this is going to be crazy already. All right, no crashes yet. Drag and dropping for empty doesn't do anything. Okay, so now if I hold this. Everything exploded. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, it's expecting a string. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. It wants the name of the sprite, of the texture. Is it just not named then? Is that going to be correct? No. But really? There's the name doesn't get saved? The name of the sprite doesn't get saved in the object here? Then I feel like I should just pass in the name here and just have the library make the sprite for me. So I can have the sprite, I can have the sprite name now because I'm just passing in the name here. And I'm gonna pass the name into here. And then it's get, it gets added to the child here. And because I did that now, not because I did that, uh, when I remove, I need to also clear out the sprite name in the remove here, the remove event for a cell. So at least now I get the cell. Uh, the cells... Okay, well, God, I gotta change all this now. Let me do this real quick. So is there any other add... Stuff here. There was an add somewhere. I think it was in the pickup. Yeah. So now I gotta do this. So here I can just do this. So if you have an item in there, you should have a sprite name. Actually, I should just check if you have a sprite name. So if you don't have one, go away. Do a move cancel. Otherwise, get drag and drop. Put the name into the texture. Let's see if that works. No errors, but... Oh. Oh, what is this? Oh, God, what did I do? Where? Drag and drop is put in the UI layer. Oh, it's probably doing something weird with the pointer, because the pointer, the pointer's position is probably in reference to the, the other room here for main. That's probably what it is. It's probably referencing the pointer's position in the main room instead of the projection of the mouse's position onto the UI layer. I bet that's the problem. 
Um, the problem is I don't know how to solve that. I don't know how to get around. Maybe the maybe there's some something in here. It's actually so simple. Ready? You ready for this? There it is. There's a separate coordinate system you can access. You just put UI at the end of X and Y here. I This might, I swear this works. <laughs> yep. That was it. Look at that. So one thing to note is the, the position of these textures are zero zeroed. So that's why it's offset like that. So if I really want to be pedantic about fixing that, um, if you have a texture, you're going to do something. But if you don't, you're just going to do this. But if you do, you're going to do this, but you're going to offset the X and Y by an amount that is the width of um, the width of this object, which is defined by the texture dimensions. So I'm going to do XUI plus, I think I want plus, it's either plus or minus. Plus width for the X, plus height for the Y. Let me see if this works. No, it is minus, almost definitely. And in fact, it should be a divide by two because I want to center it. There we go. It's centered. Okay, there we go. It's center now. If I got a pointer up for the drag and drop, it should clear out its texture. We're going to null the texture here. So if I like just drag it up and then out over here, Okay, it didn't like the method of me clearing the texture. How would I clear a texture? I actually, is there an API for that? I don't know if there's a way to untexture an object or a copy. Let me, let me go check, I guess. I need to set this to negative one. Oh, I do get an error, but it actually works. So what's interesting though, is I pointered up inside a cell here and see how it stays. What's causing that? I shouldn't have to, the developer shouldn't have to mess with these because this is managed by the library. So I'm going to avoid needing to change that information. Um, which means do I have to do all of this on the library side? I might have to. So I have the cell, I have the target cell I'm moving to. So I'm going to call it target sprite name and just get all that information here. And you know what? This would be a good opportunity to reuse uh, the API that I have here. Sprite name, template name. Yeah, I could probably just reuse this stuff. Okay, so I'm gonna have six variables here. I think this is the way to do it. I'm gonna have I'm gonna also remember the from index or the move index, move index of the cell I'm moving from. So I'm gonna have to reference that. So it's gonna be kind of a long uh statement here, but the inventory into cells getting the from index. All the correct references. Okay, so now I have 
all the info of the source and the destination, the target cell. So now, I think what I can do is just call remove. Just use the API that I already have here. So now I'm going to clear out both of those cells using this index of the destination and the move index. And then I'm going to also use the API add, which takes an index, a sprite name, and a template. So for this index, this is the target. So I want this sprite name and this sprite template. And then for the move index, I want the source sprite name and the source template. So actually, I don't even need, I don't need to reuse the sprite information because the API will handle all that for me. This might be it. Is this actually going to work? Properties of undefined reading inventory sprite name. One moment. Oh, it sets move index to null. I okay, this is the problem. I set this. I forgot to move this all the way down. That should be the very last thing. Let's try that again. Okay. Nine. Cell nine, undefined, undefined, that's correct. Versus cell index three, item helmet, item helmet. That is correct. So that does get called now. What happened here? Now move index is defined. That should have worked. Wait, so that didn't get removed. Did it? Oh, it did. Okay, so the removal worked. But the next step didn't. So I think what's happening is I'm passing in effectively undefined to the tar to the source now. Oh wait, no, 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 I gotta swap. Okay, first of all, I gotta swap. This is just gonna add the, the cells back into the positions they're already in. So these need to be in uh, reversed. The move from index should now have the target and the target index should have the source. So first of all, that was incorrect. Second of all, um, this add here is, can, is receiving undefined stuff. <laughs> so I should probably protect it from doing that. The template name doesn't exist. Or rather, if it does exist, I am going to set it. And only if sprite name exists am I going to do all this other stuff, because everything else here depends on sprite name. I think I just need to guard it. Let's see if that works. <gasps> it works! Oh my god, look at that. The only thing is the pointer up doesn't... Like, it's not clearing out the, the, the drag and drop. Um, I have an idea for that. It involves me being less lazy. So I didn't need... So this is interesting. If I let the library handle all that, the developer won't need to do anything with move to by default. I might want to reserve the ability, that might just be like a setting modifier, because some games may not want to do this. I, th I think I just need to add like a little, a flag for the developer to say whether they want this functionality in or not. So let me think about what's happening with the drag and drop.
So does this mean pointer up never gets called? When I like, that, like pointer up does what I think it should do, right? There's hello there. What if I do it here? Interesting. Pointer up event doesn't propagate. Is that my understanding? Pointer up doesn't propagate. It gets stopped here with the UI box first. Interesting. Okay. Is there anything about uh, event propagation? Oh, except I... Okay, well, first of all, I just somehow duplicated items. It appears double-clicking lets me duplicate an item. And secondly, uh, my the select selections are being really weird. They're being a little wonky. If you're just clicking down and up on the same box, that's a select. So if this move to... If the index that I read from here is the same as the move index that I recorded earlier, then just don't do anything. That's what I should be doing. So we'll add another case here where if the move index is the same as the index that's coming in, that should resolve some of the issues. So that still works. Why isn't the select happening at all? It should at least be running the select. I wonder if it has to do with the mouse events. Like, click, I wonder if click is getting overshadowed. Let me run, let me try logging this click event. Yeah, it's not working. See, it's not, it's not getting the event anymore. Because now I'm listening for click, pointer down, and pointer up. These two must be overriding the click event. So I might have to write some custom logic for this to perform a select properly. So what if I do this? What if I do... What if I check for the pointer up here? instead and then i do if the move from index is equal to the cell index in here i do a return and then inventory select Oh, wait, no, cell index wants to click the cell. Maybe? Eight null, nine null, three, three. What is going on here? I'm having such an issue with this. Right, I mixed up move from and move index. I was just caught up in my head about that. So this. This should be correct. Yeah, okay. All right. Yep. Yeah. Here's the problem. So I think I wanted to propagate then. I think the developer just needs to handle that case. Move from, you can do an empty, empty spot here. Well, mm hmm. Maybe I just do this afterward. Maybe I do this afterward before I do even any logic. And then I check if it's null or if it's the same index. What if I do that? This is so confusing. This, this is getting really confusing. It would be as confusing if I only had to worry about the, the developer side of things. The fact I have to also worry about the user side of things makes this a little bit more complicated. Found it. It was all over here. Where I do move from and I check if there's a name in here and then I perform a cancel to stop a movement. 
So I need to get rid of this and just put this elsewhere. I gotta just put it elsewhere. I'm gonna worry about that issue later. But this is the more annoying issue to deal with. So now I should get the move index because now I'm no longer so it's no longer a, a problem to select an empty uh, an empty cell. But it does mean yeah, it does mean you can swap from empty to uh, one with an item, which I don't want. Okay, well, look at that. See. Now the selections are working again and swapping is working. Okay, this is really janky and I wouldn't do this. I, I think I what I need to do is just delete the drag and drop item because this is ridiculous. I gotta put this twice, this code twice here to make this work. And then I'm calling a move cancel to stop the movement from happening if you're just selecting a cell. So that's the other thing. Here's what we sh I should actually do. Here's the proper thing. Um, I'm gonna spawn, I'm spawning a drag and drop. So templates, copy, drag and drop, zero, zero. So this drag and drop needs to go First of all, you need to go. You you have caused way too many troubles being a singleton. This is on a click down. I don't need to set timeout because this is an event. It won't happen on the first frame. Get the UI layer. Put it in the UI layer. There's the problem. Uh, okay, there's more problems. On pointer up, this kill equals true. That should be, so that combined with this, that should be all I need. I can do this, I can do this. Everything's fine. We're getting copy events here. Okay. Select is broken for some reason. Pointer ups aren't working now. What? Wait a second. No, don't tell me. Is this one eating the pointer up event now? Because I spawn drag and drop in later, is it capturing the pointer up event before the inventory item now? Oh my god, it is. What? So now that I'm dynamically creating the drag and drop, this pointer up gets caught first, which means inventory item no longer gets pointer up events. So I can't do it like this unless I can find some way to propagate the pointer up across multiple. Mm. <laughs> okay, I'm in. I'm gonna need a break. I need a break. I think I found something that's going to save my life. So there's this pointer up event, right? It, it, dumb. It's dumb. You're dumb. But look at this. If I scroll down just a little bit more, pointer up outside. So I'm thinking this might be the event I want. This might be a global pointer up event, which would be great. Because it, it would mean I don't have to depend on the pointer up selecting a specific object. It's, this is just going to be like a global capture for whenever I lift the, the mouse click up anywhere. So if I do this for drag and drop, then I shouldn't need it for the this logic for the inventory item. So I think all this can stay the same now. I just don't have to worry about deleting the drag and drop thing now. I think. That's a great start. All right, I have one last idea. This might not be a global event like I thought. However, I was reading the docs 
uh, as you should when you get stuck. And I can use the action system to read global pointer input. So you can click anywhere on the screen for that event. So if I do that, this might work. Um, and it turns out, I believe this um, thing that was automatically filled in is the primary pointer, which it would be the left click or like a tap. And that is assigned to shoot. So let me change this first of all to click. Just so it makes a little more sense. And let me try doing that. So now this is going to be an action press. Uh, only I don't want it to be a press. Uh, just kidding. I want this to be a release. So if I do an action release or click and then do this, we might be getting somewhere. So if I do the same for this, this will... I don't know if I need to change this now. I, I might still need to. I might still need to. Because this drag and drop is still going to have like priority, if that makes sense. Like, I think it's still going to absorb all the clicks. Okay, but look at that. See? Oh. Oh! What? That just fixed everything. What? It actually just fixed everything. That... What? Well, sometimes things just work, and you don't understand why, and you just have to live with it. And this is going to be one of those times. All right, let's review uh, the list of things to do. I have went and added a bunch of things since the last cut. So these are all the things that are now added. All of the features are here. So I'm just going to clear those out because that is now done. And of course, I found a bunch of other things I need to fix or at least work on until this cat mod is ready. So firstly, I found this issue. Um, what you do is the swapping stuff works pretty well. And under normal circumstances, you can't swap from an empty cell to a cell with an item to do a swap unless you are swapping from a selected empty cell. Then it does perform a swap. So I figured out what, where that was happening. Um, in this inventory item, the pointer up event, it's this part of the code that's preventing swapping from empty cells. And it's just checking if it has children inside the inventory cell. So that works for cases where there's, an, there's no uh, item here, but the selection uh, sprite counts as an item because it is part of the child of the item box. So that's why that check is being bypassed in that scenario. So that's not going to work. I'm going to need another strategy that isn't just checking the children. And what I could do is let me go to the cat mod no the custom scripts inventory lib so when a cell is added it has these properties that i inject into it that don't relate to the selection sprite so i think this is what i should check for i should check for a sprite name or a sprite one of these two properties instead and see if that fixes things So let's see if that fixes things. That should be a little more robust than just checking the children uh, length. Okay, oh, there we go. The selection no longer allows me to swap from an empty cell over. But in the selection events, those all still work as expected. 
great. So, uh, this other one was another idea that I had. So what I've been doing with the pickup items... Let me go to the boy. Uh, oh no, it's not in the boy. It's actually in the pickup for the top hat. So I did this mess to try and check all of the and all of the cells and trying to find the first empty cell. But I feel like there should just be an API to do all of this for me. So that was the idea there. Also, just checking, again, just checking the children to see if it's empty. Um, I could probably force a bug to happen here. Let me try that right now, actually, uh, using the knowledge that I've learned from the previous bug. So let's say I select this empty cell and then try and pick up the top hat. I bet it will add the top hat to the second cell. Yeah, so that, that's just not robust. Uh, that's not going to work, so that's also an issue. So what I really want is, first of all, to replace this with checking for like inventory sprite name, but also I want to add another API, another method here that will call add for me, but also check for empty inventory slots first so that other people don't accidentally make the same mistake I did. They could just worry about calling the API and it will do all that work for them. So I think I'm going to make it be called push and it should have the same properties or the same arguments as add because it's going to be an add it's just I don't need to specify the index uh, this API will just decide that index for me now I should just generate what the selected index should be using this logic so I'm just gonna copy paste this because most of this is uh, are things I can use so we're gonna loop through all the cells right and not checking for children instead we're going to check if there is not a cell with this template name defined because that is something defined by the library that i know means that someone called add on it and if that is the case where that did not happen why is it Oh, I don't even need a variable here. I can just pass an I and call break on this. Let me double check everything. So now what I can do is here and call inventory. And, oh, look at that. Push is now part of the documentation. And I don't need an index anymore. And I can just call this. And let's hope I'm smart and I just did everything right the first try. Okay. It did get added as normal. Let me move these items out of the way. Let's see if it occupies the first spot. Okay. Let me put a bunch of items in the way and see if it occupies the fourth spot. All right. And then the moment of truth. I'm going to put the selection on this so it has a child and see whether... It gets added to the first or second box. Perfect. Easy. Easy. So this, oh yeah, this was another thing. So I had a way to add listeners, but typically if you have a, a method in which you're adding a listener, you also want a way to remove the listener. So here I have listen here, but and it adds to this listener's array, but you can't really remove it once you do that. So I'm going to add a remove listener function that does exactly that. And all it's going to do is do a filter. And it's going to keep all of the functions in the listeners array that aren't equal to the callback. Uh, to try it, I'm going to... I'll just add it here. I'll add something here. 
Uh, so we're going to add a listen. And I'm going to add just a fake listener. And then I'm going to log all of the listeners in the array at this point, in which case should be just one, I think. Okay, there's two. That's fine. That's fine that there's two. Um, but now I'm going to remove listener and I need a reference to this thing that I made. Otherwise it's not gonna be able to find it because it, I'm just gonna remove by reference. That will be acceptable. In fact, that's probably the only way to do that is remove by reference because functions aren't values. And look at that. It was removed immediately and only the original listener is here. Clearing all listeners should be much simpler. Uh, inventory lib. Should I say remove listeners? Remove all listeners? Clear listeners? Probably think more than two seconds about what the name should be. Really, I think I can just drop the array, just straight up set it to a new array, and let the let the JavaScript engine just deal with the aftermath. Let's test this real quick. Whatever, I'm running it. Yeah, that worked. Because the, the the whatever other listener I have later here, that gets called a tick later. So it's, I can't clear that one at this point. I could change it so that it does. So if I put it here, then it should say zero. Yeah. All right. Good, good, good. Does the multi-listeners work and can be removed? No problem. And then I'm going to listen to action. I'm going to test this out by listening to the move to action. And when that happens, I'm just going to clear listeners. So I got a second listener that should not affect the logic of what's happening with the first listener, except for the case where I perform a move to action. So this ping should happen every time I do like a select or something. All right, now the move to and that cleared everything because now there's no functionality with the inventory. Yes, that does work. So I talked about this earlier, the option to disable moving the items around and having that be managed by the library, because that's all happening here in this script. Uh, the move from and move to. So all of this, just a way to disable that so it's not just working by default. I think it's just as simple as adding a new property here that can be written to. Allow moving default to true. And literally, when this move from and move to happens, uh, just return out when the event happens here. And return out early when allow moving needs to be prefix with inventory dot and we'll just check if allow moving set to true otherwise just return early let me make sure everything works with that inclusion okay now I'm going to in the inventory object set that to false
So I think it's still going to run the, re, uh, do the drag and drop stuff. Cannot read properties of undefined. I messed up somewhere. Reading inventory sprite name. At what point are you attempting to do this? We can actually, oh, I can actually get the, the line where this is happening. It looks like, where is this? On the pointer up event for the inventory item, it's happening there. It's happening here. This is this is the error line. So it didn't recognize that I wanted. There can't be a move index. I think the problem is there's no move index here. There's no move from. So it can't ever do the select. Okay, I've decided what I'm going to do for this. I'm going to make this one exception. I'm going to allow move index to be defined when the move from happens, but I will never call the listeners. So here's what's going to happen. If you do a pointer down like I'm doing here and you try and call move from, it will at least report the move index. But what will happen now is it will get blocked at this point if allow moving is false and I'm just not going to call listeners. So what that means here at the move to is I'm also going to stop before the listeners are called and therefore before all this other stuff where the swapping actually happens. But I need to be careful. I cannot just perform a return because now this move index is defined and it normally gets cleared at the end of this function. So now I'm just going to clear it early here and then return. So this should make it so that I can keep this style of checking whether uh, the user intended a selection uh, for this scenario like so but now yeah moving no longer is a thing that exists so i am creating the drag and drop object but because it never gets a texture it looks like the, the drag and drop also is disabled when it really just is textureless. So that's a really interesting consequence, but that, that does work pretty well. So I think I will keep that functionality. I just have to remember, let me put a documentation there um, for the to-do list. I got to remember when disabling moving items, the index still gets populated until move to is called um, and it gets populated when move from is called and deleted when move to is called. So I, th I think that's okay, which leads to the last API change, which is handling a case where the inventory size can change over time during gameplay. Um, I can definitely see a case where that would be useful. So I want to have that be an option, which means changing this whole initialization thing. I can't assume it's only going to run once and maybe it'll run multiple times. Maybe we'll have a different API for changing the size after initialization. I will need some time to think about it. So first of all, I think I want to change init. I think I want to call set size this should be the real first thing that should be called and i'm going to make it so you can call this multiple times there's a couple consequences i'm going to be uh concerned about uh, the most important one is what happens if you decrease the inventory size and there are items in those cells that would get removed so i think i would just 
I think it would just remove it. Like that's up to the developer's responsibility to make sure there's items that don't get cleared out for whatever reason you want to reduce inventory size. So the other case is what should happen when you resize an inventory at all. Should the library try and keep all of the states of the cells or should it be up to the developer to basically record what was in those cells and then repopulate them by recalling add? So do, doing that, the latter option is easier for me, but it's probably going to be harder for the developer and I would rather have it be harder for me and have it be easier on the developer. So that would mean I want to default to preserving the contents of the cells. So if it doesn't exist, actually I should do if it does exist. So calling a new size, right? Setting everything up again. If that cell does exist, I don't want to touch it. So I'm going to leave it alone. Um, but if it doesn't exist, then it's going to, oh no, not break, uh, continue. I want to continue the loop. Yeah, if it exists, continue the loop. And if it doesn't exist, then I can do this. And then it will just add a new cell to the array here. That's fine. The harder case is going to be if the size gets smaller, because what's going to happen here is this loop will go through all of the cells and it's going to hit this every single time because all the cells already exist within that range. And then the loop's going to end. Now what I need to do is remove cells past the inventory size limit. So I actually have to do that here. And there's actually another interesting consequence. Um, because I'm removing stuff, the user could be selecting an index of a cell that will now no longer exist if it happens to be in the middle of the inventory changing size. So I'm also going to have to check if the new index, both for selected index and for move index, is going to be out of bounds and then act appropriately. Let me run through an example here. So let's say I had 10 cells and I want to go to four. So what this would do, well, what I want it to do is go from index zero to three because that's four elements and then all these elements would go away so what splice is going to do here is go to this new length well the, no it's going to go to the current length here which is 10 which actually is not what i want i wanted to start at index inventory size so that'd be index four. And now I want it to remove this number of elements, which is the cell's length, which is 10 minus four equals six. So it's gonna remove six elements, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That looks correct. I think that's the correct call there. And splice overwrites the original array, so I don't need to set inventory cells with this result where I'm going to get the copy and then just set its kill value to true. Let's start with that. Let me test that adding more cells is still fine. Yes, it is. Uh, allow moving is still disabled. Let me fix that. Okay, it even works if I'm holding an object and the inventory size changes and then I can move it over to a new cell. All right, now I'm going to reduce it down to three cells. Let's see if performing that kill thing that did work. So now let me do these other checks here. So 
So it doesn't exist. Let's get this back to null. If that doesn't exist, form the move cancel. All right. Let's test this again for real Z's now. Okay, I'm pretty sure I attempted to move the item as it was. Yeah, that worked. And now let me get the selection index here. Yeah. Oh yeah. That worked. And actually that does give me an idea of one more thing to test. And that is what happens if the inventory is full and you try and pick up an item with how I have everything implemented. So that was only one item. What happens if I perform the pickup? Oh. <laughs> Nothing happened. Actually that yeah, that checks out the way I implemented that. Okay. That actually did everything I wanted it to do. That was more simple than I thought. Which means I implemented all the features that I think this library should have. Uh, which makes the next part very fun because it means making this into an official cat mod. Well, not official, but making it into a cat mod. And then uh, adding the documentation. And this would be a good opportunity for everyone to learn how that works, because that's a whole process. Okay, so now I'm ready to do one of the last steps here, which is to make a cat mod. Now, cat mods are a very special concept in CTJS. They let you extend the engine, basically. And that's what we're doing here with this inventory mod, is we want to add an inventory system which you can just activate in your game and then use it like a library. So uh, there's actually one other thing I want to do with the API, but I'll get to that in a moment. So first of all, here's the cat mod list. Here's all the current things you can extend uh, for your game. You can see there's some stuff that will be automatically selected, uh, such as the, where are you? Pointer module that allows mouse events um, to be able to be used for the developer. So what I'm going to do actually is expand upon a cat mod I've made previously called VGUI. Now, if you want to learn more about cat mods, first of all, you can go to docs.ctjs.rocks. And for the documentation, you can scroll down here on this sidebar all the way to modding CTJS. And this will give you a pretty good overview on the kind of things you can do. You can actually do quite a bit of stuff, and I won't even be using the more powerful features for this cat mod. I'm simply going to be adding a new object to the base CT object. So I'm going to go over briefly using an existing cat mod that I made on what are the essential files and folders you need. So these folders are actually empty. I don't use those. Uh, the docs is going to be the one of the important ones. So I'm just going to start from the readme though. So it's just a readme. Um, these types of markdown files, like API reference here in text box under the docs, those will be readable when you activate the cat mod in the engine. So let me demonstrate here. So this is, first of all, my VGUI cat mod. It's got all of these doc files in them. If you want to read them from within the engine, you want to make sure it's activated. So in my case, it's here. And then you can see for here, there's actually a VGUI. Um, you can have settings here. I don't have anything here, but these would be cat mod specific settings. But the docs are actually located here on this side bar button that expands. This is how I've been accessing my notepad for all my to-dos. And if you go to the furthest right tab, there's modules docs. And then you can scroll down until you find the cat mod. Uh, in this case, it's VGUI. And there it is. There's the readme. And then there's that API reference and text box markdown files. 
So those will be important for any user who wants to use the library. So we will need to write some markdown files for that to put tutorials and things like that. Uh, the next most important thing, actually the most important file is the module.json. And this is what ctjs uh, reads to kind of parse what's going on in your cat mod. So this is a general structure. There's actually a general structure uh, described here on this page, uh, but briefly explaining it. Name of my cat mod, uh, description, version, authors, categories, fields, dependencies. I depend on the pointer cat mod. So that's why that's written there. Um, the index.js is your actual code that will get run on startup. In this case, it's pretty simple for me what I need. So I made an immediately invoked function expression. And all that is is just fancy talk for it's going to it's going to run everything in this immediately. Um, so here's my text box, which already exists, and I've written a lot of code for it. So text box definition, and then here's where this text box get exposed. So it's part of the CT object, and then you access it by a VGUI, and then the text box property. So if I go to my, um, if I go to my game here and just start writing um, the, the properties to access that object. You see there's even tutorials here. I do ct.vgui. So that's another important thing here. You can see there's auto completion enabled here. So in order for that to work, you need a types.d.ts file. So this is a TypeScript file that basically helps the engine um, parse all of your methods and, and your APIs and your classes and all that. So here's my text box definition under the namespace VGUI. I got another interface here. I got some methods uh, and some properties, which we also have with our inventory that we'll need to write out constructors so that this all allows this auto completion to work a lot better. So that's also going to be an important part of writing the documentation. And then of course there's the markdown files. Um, this API reference is actually just the types.d.ts file. It's just that this ts file is something the engine reads, but the user can't read. So having an API reference here is useful for a developer who can't read that ts file in here but needs to know regardless um, all the options available for them so what i'm going to do is basically expand upon this existing um, cat mod and then include this inventory code that i've written throughout this whole video which is here so this all this is going to get moved into that cat mod and I'll show you what that looks like in just a moment. All right, let me show what I did here. So I just added one small thing. Now, it wouldn't make much sense to add this inventory system to my VGUI cat mod without there being some vector graphics, because that's part of the name. So what I have here is a third argument to this set size method. And what it does is if you pass it some dimensions, uh, in that third argument, it's going to run this, which basically creates a pixie graphics object and then sets an inventory. Uh, it, it, it creates a square, basically, in place of an inventory sprite and then draws it and then adds it up to the copy. So what I did here, I did, again, a small change. I set the size here. And then I include that third argument here to set the width and height. And then the set timeout here where I was changing the size over time, I don't include that argument. So I'm going to show you what happens in this case. So here's what that looks like by default. And then a bit later, I didn't include that third argument. And so now it's drawing um, the, that, those sprites underneath. So that's what that looks like. And of course the selections and all that still works, but I figured it'd be sensible to have some way to have some like basic default 
graphics rendering for the developer because that's actually what I also use for the text box. There's also a default rendering of a text box uh, if the developer chooses not to write their own. So that's all I did. And that was just writing the vector graphics part of it. And now I can start the documentation. All right, well, the main part is finished. So here's that index.js file for this cat mod. Here's the text boxes earlier. And now there's a new class called inventory. So all that code that I've written that was inside the CTJS engine is basically here. And all I did was make some, some general changes to make it into a class. And I made all those, those properties into proper methods. And I have a constructor now, and then I just had to change some references around. But this is, other than that, it's just the same code. And now inventory is an exposed property inside ct.bgui. Now, how do you get this into ctjs? Well, if you go to project and then cat mods and scroll all the way to the bottom, there's an import modules button. So you can actually import um, all of the code that's in here into the cat mod as a zip file. So what you do is you zip all of the files and folders in the directory. You don't zip the parent folder and then you zip it all into this file and then you import that zip into here through that button. And then you go ahead and search for the cat mod that got added to the list. As you can see here, here's my v1.1.0 VGUI. It actually has the, the current one that I demonstrated here too. But after you activate that, you can go ahead and use it. So how did I use it here? Well, in custom scripts, I got rid of everything that was in here. And all I need to do is replace it with this. So here's my inventory. Remember, this is a global variable, globally accessible to all the objects. And I just call new ct.bgui.inventory. That's the only change I needed. Everything else here stays the exact same because they're all referencing that global inventory object. And now when I run it, it will perform exactly the same as it was doing before. So that's all working. And now the next step is to write some documentation. So I did some programming off camera and basically all the docs and typings are done. I made a whole new project just to test the code changes or rather the code snippets that I put in for the tutorials. And this is just what that mess looks like. But yeah, let me show you what the docs look like here. So again, I packaged it, I packaged it all up into a zip and then added it as a cat mod again. So now all the updated stuff is going to show in the docs. Now I did make a few other changes. Um, the injected property for the sprite name, the inventory sprite name, I now call the inventory texture name. CTGS calls them textures, not sprites. Uh, Pixie calls them sprites, so I went with what CTGS calls them. Um, I realized I didn't have an add event, but I had a remove event, so I added an add event. And then also I made enums for the inventory event types like add, remove, and etc., which you'll see in a moment. But here's the docs. And so here's the API reference, which is now updated to include the inventory as well as the inventory events and some other fun stuff. And the actual tutorials are here under inventory. So just a bunch of sample snippets and explaining what the APIs do, a uh, simple grid, a uh, circular uh, structure of cells, a uh, single line of cells, how to populate the inventory, inventory events, explaining the different kinds, and uh, a really uh, much better way to implement drag and drop, which is under the tricks section. So this is a lot simpler than what I showed earlier in the video. So it's just a bit of optimization there. And uh, the typings are really cool. So let me demonstrate those because that allows autocomplete stuff to work. So let me demonstrate. I'll make a new inventory. Uh, 
object. So first of all, right, auto completion. So if I wanted to see all the available methods, I could just do inventory dot, and I can see all my methods here. I can see set size. I can see the properties here, selected index, listen, clear listeners. So let's go try and initialize an inventory. Look at that. Tells me the type of the arguments, how many arguments there are, what you got to put in, uh, even this question mark here, uh, whether they're optional arguments. So I put in, I don't know, like, so as the first argument is going to complain, right? It's going to complain argument for callback not provided, expect two, three arguments, but got one. So let's do 10. Let's do a, let's add a callback here. Oh, it's an error because it knows that I passed in a function that returns void and it knows that I need to return a type copy instead. So just really smart stuff like that. Um, the, even stuff like the move index, if you try and force set it, the letting the library do it for you, it's going to complain to you that it's a read-only property. So just a bunch of cool stuff uh, like that. So select, you would pass in an index normally. This is a string. It's complaining because you should put in a number. So really, uh, this is all set. So I will be publishing this uh, very soon. And hopefully you all learned something from watching this.